So uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. We're glad to be here. So with me, I have Adam and Michelle. Now, your last name, is it Behringer? I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. Yes, that's That's right. right. All right. Excellent. So welcome to you both. And um, I thought maybe we'd start by just having you give uh, maybe a short introduction um, of each other and uh, and then maybe about your family. Yeah, so uh, I am, how old am I, 33 years old? <laughs> and, <laughs> it's hard to remember. Yeah, and, once you uh, hit 30, it's like, why do you even count? I like, know, <laughs> I know. But once, you, once you get married and have a family, you don't, you don't yeah. really count anymore. Right. Anyway. But, well, uh, one thing's for sure, you, you don't have anybody saying I'm 33 and a half. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I uh, still work outside of the home, and uh, but my passion is is growing food and, and farming and uh, building systems and making the land better, you know, improving uh, the quality of, of everything around here, the land and the animals and, uh, and us, you know, when we eventually eat the food. So that's my passion. Um, we've been married for a while. I'm gonna let you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> smart man, smart man. Um, uh, it'll be 13 years. Yeah. This, this I was going to say 11. So 11. Ooh. It's a good thing you let her answer that. Yeah. So 13 years we've been married. Um, we've got four kids. Our, our newest is just nine weeks old. He's sitting on my lap right now. So he might, he might start crying in a minute. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and we homeschool and we have a graphic tea business called Farm Life Outfitters that I started back in 2016 and it is really fun. I have a, a background in graphic design and, um, so that was just sort of a creative outlet for me, but it, it really was something I think the Lord put on both of our hearts to start and it really has just kind of evolved and developed and you know now we're into YouTube and and um, sharing our lives that way and education and I teach small business marketing classes locally and just all kinds of stuff so oh wow so yeah. so you've got your hands on a lot of uh, in a lot of pies so to speak right exactly Excellent. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, how many children did you say you had? I, I, I missed that. We have four. You have four, four children, and, and I believe your oldest is Sydney that just uh, celebrated her 10th yes. birthday, correct? Yes. And then right. all, all the way down to you said it was, that your youngest is nine months? Nine weeks. Nine yeah. weeks. Oh, uh-huh. wow. There's a big difference yeah, between those two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 10 years to nine weeks. Wow. Um, well, First of all, congratulations on the baby, and uh, and then congratulations, obviously, to Sydney on on ten years. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how fast the time flies, isn't it? It is, yeah, it's crazy. My my son is about ready to. We just have one boy, and he's about ready to uh, turn sixteen. So it's the big year, and wow. uh, you know he's counting down to uh, driving and all of those kinds of things. And you know, it's one of those situations where when people tell you when you've got young kids, don't blink, you'll miss it. Yeah. You don't really get it. And then yeah. all of a sudden you wake up one day and they're 10 or they're 16 and you're thinking, how in the world did, did this happen? That's right. So you try to cherish every day, that's for sure. And I think that's one of the things that's awesome about homesteading, at least from my perspective, is I really do feel like it does help us um, to, to maximize the time with it with our kids if we do it i don't want to say if we do it right because that may be a bit judgmental mm-hmm. um but there certainly is a component of it where you really can um to spend a lot of great quality time together as a family mm-hmm. yeah yeah we we figured out that we're very home centered you know it started with bringing michelle home from her job and then homesteading and home church and so we're, we're very we're very home centered mm-hmm. so. My, my wife and I are, are very much homebodies. Um, you know, if, if I didn't have to leave here, I, I don't know as I would. I, I just love being on the homestead and doing stuff around here. And then, of course, then they have the mandatory quarantine and then you can't go anywhere and that's a different story. But I'm going to try not to touch too much on that today. Right. <laughs> so how long have you been homesteading? About five, five years. Yeah, yeah. 
like legit homesteading probably five years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We had chickens in a garden, you know, for probably 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Which we've been married. Yeah. Just a little something, but I would say five years. Yeah. And, and kind of what, what drew you to, to the, lo- to the lifestyle? I mean, did you grow up around it or is yes. it something kind of fresh? Sort of. I mean, I did. Uh, here, where we live now is the, the place that I grew up in. It's the house that I grew up in. And so we always had a garden and chickens, and, but it was not uh, at the level that we're at now. Mm-hmm. I would say the main reason we got into it is, is the food. Mm-hmm. We, we had some health problems. Michelle mainly had mm-hmm. some health issues, and we finally figured out that it was uh, the food that we were eating. And so we, we started making changes, gradual changes, and that led us to one thing, you know, and one thing led to another. And, and now we're, you know, we can look at our plate at night and say, you know, we grew all this. There's nothing from the store. Yeah. And, and, and about how much of your own food are you growing? Is it 100%, 80%? Um, I would say 75%. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And, and how large is your home set? I mean, how much area do you have to do this on? It's uh, 15 acres. And are you utilizing all of it or do you have some of it that you lease out or how do you handle that? Yeah, we use pretty much all of it. Uh, Most of it is pasture or uh, wooded area. Um, Our garden is about a quarter acre. Okay. And as far as on the pasture, what are you raising? Are you raising cows, goats, pigs? A little bit of everything. (laughs) (laughs) So we, we we have cows. We have a dairy cow. Uh, we have sheep, we have a couple goats, we have, uh, what, five pigs yeah. and a whole mess of chickens. I think <laughs> we have, what, 300 chickens here right now? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> we're, we, got, we got chicks. We're raising yeah. um, some Cornish cross uh, there on the pasture right now. So we have little chickens right now, yeah. but yeah, we have a bunch of chickens. Yeah. Well, you, you've even got me beat there. At, at one point, we had about, a, um, I'm trying to think, probably a little over 100 when we had our Cornish crosses, and then we've got our, our pullets that we're raising out. I cycle my flock out every year, so once my pullets start laying, then my, my hens become canned chicken. Yeah. So right now, we're, we're kind of on the up, upside of the numbers, although we're down a little bit because the Cornish are now at freezer camp. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you guys have got me beat by quite a few. Now, how many Cornish cross do you have? Oh, there's two batches here now, which we, we sold some out of the brooder. So I think total we have about 150 here now. But okay. We're doing, we're doing five batches of 100 each, and, and some of those will sell out of brooder, brooder and some will, will raise here. And how many of those are, are you planning as far as full-grown birds? Do you sell to customers? or? Yeah, we'll, we'll likely keep 100 for ourselves. Okay. And sell the rest. Nice. And do you sell them at farmers markets or how what's what's kind of your channel as far as, as selling your 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 animals? Um we've had pretty good luck, at least this year, with having people come here. Just we had a little farmstead here or farm stand here um, at the farm where we've been selling produce. And so uh, we're gonna try to sell just to people for people to come pick up. Nice. And you said you do a garden and uh, and watching your videos, I think you guys revealed that you have 600 and some odd tomato plants. Yeah. Yeah. And you're you're basically harvesting like a ton at a time. Yeah. It's been crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Our main focus this year was tomatoes. Nice. A pretty good market here where we live for tomatoes. And so we decided to give it a try. Good. Good. It's one of the things I think that's sometimes it's, it's, a challenge finding the niche that needs to be filled for, for us here. Initially I tried marketing broilers and there's just so many people in our area doing broilers that I, I, I struggled to sell them. So, you know, finding kind of that, that market sounds to me like between tomatoes and chickens, you're, you're doing well. Yeah. The nice thing about chicken is that uh, you can store it, you know, correct. Yeah. Then, then tomatoes are produce where you have to sell it immediately. You know, right? Chicken is a little easier in the marketing aspect. That's, that's definitely a good point. So you're in North Carolina, and your your climate there, as far as for your growing season and 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 those kinds of things, what's that like? So uh, we have crops in the ground ground from um, 
April to October, typically. I mean, we have, you know, winter vegetables, collards and turnips and kale and things like that throughout the winter. But the main growing season is from April to early October. And as far as winter, do you get snow or what? what's kind of that like for you? Uh, not really. I mean, we'll occasionally, you know, we'll have, we usually get at least an inch or two every year, but occasionally we'll get six to 10 inches you know, every five beers or something will yeah, get us through like that. Nothing like you're used to, I'm yeah, sure. There. Yeah. <laughs> Although quite honestly, it's, it's been amazing to me how odd the, uh, the snowfall has been here the last several years. It, it, it seemed like this year was shaping up to be a great winter for snow. Mm-hmm. We had some great snowstorms in November and then all of a sudden we, we didn't get hardly anything the rest of the year. So it's, it's been really weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was kind of like that here. But the past few winters, it, it was cold initially, you know, in November and early December, and then it warmed up. And, and at least for us, it hasn't gotten cold enough to kill off some of, you know, your tick problems and your pest problems that the cold can kind of deal with or at least slow down. Yeah. Um, sometimes we haven't gotten cold enough to... Uh, to deal with those things. So you're on 15 acres um, and you're, you're doing all of these things. I guess, when did you feel like you went from just being a gardener and maybe having a few chickens to being a full blown homesteader? You know, what, what does homesteading mean to you? Um, I feel like it's been this year. Yeah. Wouldn't you say this yeah, year? I think we, this year. We finally feel like we have things in place and, and we can just manage it. Um, you know, I spent the last five years here building fence, putting in infrastructure, you know, deciding what works and what doesn't. And, and I feel like this year we we're finally at a place where we can just kind of, I don't say it's not relaxed, but it's, it's yeah. like manageable. Yeah. Feel more settled yeah. in what we're doing and how yeah. we're doing it and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so as far as from your perspective, what does it mean to be a homesteader? Um, for me, it's, it's you know, providing for yourself and your neighbors, you know, that's a, that's a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also, uh, learning new skills that, uh, are, are lost and, and, you know, lost and dying and trying new things, you know, experimenting. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. And just like you said at the beginning that we're just home centered, Mm -hmm people and um so just trying to do as much as we can use use our resources that we have here you know inviting people over you know being being hospitable being community minded i guess mm-hmm. is is a big part of homesteading i believe and yeah yeah that's one of the things i i kind of um i'm a little bit envious of um for for you guys down that way it seems like and maybe it's just I haven't found my 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 group yet. There there are a lot of people that I know that that you know raise and grow food, and I'm starting to make those connections. But it seems like there's a little bit more of a robust homesteading community in the South. At least that's my perception of it. Maybe that's unfair, um, but it seems to me that the homesteading community and maybe an understanding and appreciation of that is a bit greater down south. I, I don't know what what's your, what's your thoughts on that. I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, there's a big community of homesteaders just in North Carolina and um, Virginia. Um, you know, we we started following Joel Salatin several years ago and and got to visit Polyface, and that was kind of like one of those. I don't know. That was that was a pretty cool moment because that was like, you know, you expect you, you have it all built up in your mind what it's going to be like, and then you get there. And I think for Adam, he was just like, we can do this. Like it was kind of, it looks like our place. It looks like our place. Like, (laughs) you know, it wasn't like, I don't know. It wasn't one of these grand, you know, things that was like unattainable for all homesteaders. It was just like, you know, he's, he's done the work over the years. He's, he's done the systems. He's done the experimenting and, and, um, and kind of made us a little roadmap for the other homesteaders. And, you know, anyone can do that uh, who, you know, really wants to. So, um, but yeah, I agree. Like it, I, we have a lot of, of friends down here and then uh, people that we, that don't do like YouTube, like, cause of, well, a lot of us homesteaders are on YouTube, but 
even people that don't do YouTube have found us from watching our channel and we've gotten to connect with them on a personal level and, and, you know, build those relationships here too. And they're doing the same thing. They're homesteading also, and they just don't, you know, broadcast it on YouTube. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And there, there definitely is a sense to where, you know, you kind of have those, you know, maybe that YouTube's I've even found, maybe there's a YouTube subculture and a Facebook group subculture and a, and a yeah. Reddit subculture. And, and sometimes the paths cross and sometimes they don't. Right. And, and I think, that, I think being able to make those connections online, I think is important. A lot of people did not grow up learning these methods um, and, you know, knowing how to plant a garden and knowing how to raise chickens. And, and so sometimes you don't have those local mentors that you can learn from and the, and the online community can help fill that void. But there's just something about that face to face. Although I know right now it's a little bit more difficult, <laughs> but, but those face to face connections and that in person, you know, the encouragement that you can give one another, um, right. I think is, is really, really important. That's right. That's been a huge benefit of our farm stand this year. Uh, we've never, We've never really opened our farm up for sales mm -hmm. until this year, but I mean, we've met people who live within a five mile radius that we would, we have never known, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been nice. We, we've experienced the same thing here with, with our homestead in that for, for the first several years that we were doing a lot of these things, um, we were taking our, our eggs and our produce to the church that we were attending at the time and just giving it away. And in part was because the, the church that we were attending, it was in a more suburban, shall we say, environment. And we were the oddballs. You know, there were a few people that might have a, a you know, a four by four raised garden in their backyard that they maybe raised some herbs and a couple of tomato plants in. But that was pretty much it. And it was really at that point that people started referring to what we were doing as a farm. And I had never really thought of it that way. And then, you know, fast forward a few years to where we, we changed churches and the church that we're now attending is a country church. And there are a lot of people in our church who are, you know, they have market gardens and they're raising chickens and, and they're raising eggs to sell. And, and my wife and I didn't feel right now bringing our produce mm -hmm. to church and, and giving it away. Not that we're trying to be closed fisted. But on the other hand, when people are doing that for a living, you, you want to honor that, if that makes any sense. And so at that point, that's when we said, well, let's put a roadside stand out. And we started selling our eggs. And then last year, we put a, a, a farm stand uh, up there and started selling our vegetables. And, uh, and then through that, we were able to sell chickens and turkeys and pigs and, and so forth. And the, the connection that you can make with people, even if they're not interested in raising their own food, but the sense of community that you get and that, I don't know, that sense of th that you're helping to feed people good food. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, I think that's great. And, and um, that's been something that's been very um, fulfilling, I guess, for us. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Yeah. People, I mean, people really appreciate it. I think, you know, that's what I've noticed. The people that have been coming here, they're really appreciative of the quality, you know, that we provide. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's reasonably priced too. You know, we're not we're not charging top dollar for our stuff. Yeah, and I, and I think the you know, I I have one customer who drives uh, almost it's forty five minutes to an hour one way to get our eggs. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And and he'll buy them, you know, five six dozen at a time. Um, and he usually calls ahead and I'll hold back eggs for him and whatnot. But as I've, as I've chatted with that gentleman, um, come to find out, you know, he's, he's a retired guy. He's now living in a, I think in a townhouse. He can't, he used to have chickens and, and do a lot of these things and he can't do them anymore. Yeah. Um, and so to a certain extent, he's living vicariously through us, which, you know, it, it's, it's an honor to be able to, to, you know, help feed him and, and, you know, kind of this stage of his life. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Something that I, that I think about is, um, you know, how, how do we prevent that from happening to us? You know, because that, that's part of the homestead journey as well as our future, you know, teaching our kids these skills and, and this lifestyle and not forcing it on them, but just giving them the opportunity to do that. 
But I mean, at some point, we're not going to be able to do this. You know, we're going to be in the same position somewhat, you know, and so we're hoping to instill in our kids these values and skills so that they can carry it on. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a great point. And it's, it's one of those things that I, I saw. And in fact, to kind of give you a little bit of my backstory, um, back in 2007, my wife and I relocated back to the States because my grandfather was, um, you know, he was getting up in years and um, it was looking like he wasn't going to be able to live on his own for much longer. And so our desire was to, to buy a place close by, you know, to him so that we could kind of keep an eye on him and help him stay in his home as long as we could. And our initial plan was to spend six months with him. And that six months turned into 18 months. <laughs> um, but it was one of those things where it, it ended up being a blessing um, because it was really through that that I, I discovered um, my love for the earth and my love for planting things and, 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 and my love for really for homesteading. So we were able to uh, help him, first of all, stay in his home longer, but uh, then also h- helped provide him with good food uh, until, I mean, not to say that when he moved up to my aunt, he didn't get good food anymore. Sorry, Aunt Nessa, I'm not saying that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but th- there was a sense to where we were able to honor and I, and I, and that really was what my wife and I saw it as is, is our opportunity to honor our fathers and our mothers in the Lord. Right. And, and then, you know, the, the and I, well, I'm supposed to be interviewing you guys and then I'm, I'm sharing my story. Um, <laughs> but I guess that's what this is about, right? What, what, right. It's that conversation for, for, for me, um, you know, my, my mom will tell you that out of her three boys, I'm the one that she would have voted the least likely to ever do something like this. Um, in fact, my we had a little bit of a family get together this past weekend, and my one aunt said to me, Brian, out of all of Cora's boys, I never would have picked you to be the farmer. <laughs> but it was through that relationship that I had with my grandfather that I was able to kind of make those connections back to the things that I grew up around but never really owned you know, never really had much of an interest in. And and kind of where I'm going with this is right now, my son, um, he loves the chickens and he's, he's interested in the chickens and he does all of that stuff. But right now he has no interest in, in homesteading. And sometimes he kind of rolls his eyes at me when I talk about homesteading because I'm kind of consumed by it. And, but, but for me, I feel like all I can do is kind of, you know, have him be involved um, I don't force him to do a lot of things, um, but there are times when I say, hey, you know, we got to shovel the chicken coop out. You got to come help me. And and we work alongside together. And my hope is that, you know, someday it may take root in, in his heart. And if it doesn't, well, it, at least he understands where his food comes from. I feel like our, um, our kids are really, um, I mean, they're getting a, a great education um just by helping adam in the in the garden and and helping with our animals and and learning all these things but we you know we can't really control what they're going to do when they grow up um but i i really just feel like in my heart that that they're going to really know the value of what they've of how they've grown up and of raising raising food for themselves and that, you know, when they're able to get food out of convenience one day, it's just not going to mean, mean anything. And, um, so that's my hope anyways, that they're going to, they're going to remember and want to, want to do that for their families one day. If nothing else, they'll at least understand the value of food. In the United States, it's become such a commodity where, where people just don't appreciate what goes into it. And when you, you know, have blood, sweat, and tears invested in it, and literally blood, sweat, and tears, mm-hmm. you, you appreciate that a lot more, at, at least in my mind, and I think you're going to be a lot less likely to waste things. Yeah. At least that's my hope. That's right. And, and, you know, while we on the homestead, yes, we're raising animals, we're raising, you know, vegetables and all of those kinds of things, hopefully that will translate on to an appreciation for food in general, even if they choose not to do this. 
Right. You mentioned a little bit ago that you've kind of, you know, tried a few things and tried to figure out what works for you. I think that was how you phrased it, Adam. What are some of the things that um, you experimented with that maybe didn't work? Oh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, uh, I know there's a lot. Well, I mean, I know what to start with. We didn't know what we were doing when we got into livestock. Yeah, that was a struggle. Um, yeah. yeah, we, I mean, in North Carolina, it's, it's pretty difficult, I would say, to raise sheep and goats um, if you don't know what you're doing mm -hmm. uh, because the parasite load is so heavy here um, during the summers. And so, yeah, we, <laughs> we got mm -hmm. sheep and we didn't know what, and goats and we didn't know what we were doing and we lost a bunch that way. Yeah. Not a bunch, but we we were just uneducated, <laughs> and um, well, we did the typical. You know, we bought animals and then we bought pets. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That was the first mistake. Um. Yeah, that was that was hard. Yeah. Uh, working through all that mm -hmm. inexpensive. Inexpensive. Yeah. Those are tough lessons to learn for sure. That's right. That's right. And I've been through, you know, countless chicken tractor designs <laughs> and, and I'm still like fixing them, <laughs> fixing the ones just to keep them going. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's always a work in progress. Just finding something that works with chicken tractors. Well, just anything like even down to like your fencing, you just switched up your fencing not yeah. too long ago because yeah. you, you liked this better, you mm -hmm. know, that you're doing now than, than what you started with. So yeah. It's a constant learning, evolving process, for sure. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing that um, people that are new to homesteading need to keep in mind is that just because you, you see something and it works for one particular person doesn't necessarily it's going it means it's going to work for you. You've right. got to kind of figure out what works for your land, for your situation, you know, as far as from the standpoint of, you know, the hours that you can dedicate to things. Right. Um, and it's definitely that evolution of, you know, I tried this, it worked, but can I try this and might it work better? Right. Yeah. Everyone's so different. Like, um, I was just thinking of a friend of ours, um, was wanting to get into homesteading and she was wanting us to come and look at her property and tell her what, what she should do or whatever. And Adam said, you know, she just needs to try something. I mean, she just needs to do what she what she thinks she'll enjoy doing to start with. And, um, you know, we don't really need to, she doesn't have to copy us or, or anyone else. Just, you know, start with what you know, or, you know, you like already and then see if it works for your property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Another thing I, I think people have a tendency to do when they're, when they're brand new to homesteading is they just try to do way too much too quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. especially when people are so excited about it, you know, they try to raise and grow all the things and do all the things. And uh, that can be a recipe for disaster as well. Yeah, it's very overwhelming for sure. Especially this time of the year. You know, you, you start a, a, a garden and it just gets bigger and bigger <laughs> as you're planting <laughs> seeds, you know. And, and mm -hmm. then this time of the year, you're out there <laughs> weed whacking. <everything. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is where you lost the battle with the hoe, you know, you just <laughs> get the weed eater out. And <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, uh, is that something that you, you know from experience? <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, right before this interview, I was fixing to go out there and weed eat some of the garden <laughs> because I was gotten away from it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it is so tempting just to, you know, you, I've got a few extra seeds to plant. Oh, you know, I'll put them in the ground somewhere. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, what am I going to do with all of this? And that's one of the things that um, back when I started this podcast um, at the end of last year, I, I did a series on gardening. And one of the things I suggested is that before people ever put a seed in the ground, the first thing they need to think about is, I should say the first thing, but one of the first things they need to think about is what are you going to do with the harvest? What are your plans for the harvest? If you're just going to eat it fresh, that's different than if you're going to preserve it, if you're going to can it, if you're going to freeze it, if you're going to dehydrate it. and and even though I, I give that advice, <laughs> sometimes I don't take my own advice. It's hard. It's, I mean, it's the busiest, it's the busiest mm -hmm. time of the year for everybody, and and yeah. put preserving on top of of all the harvesting and the keeping up with everything. And it's like mm -hmm. it's too much sometimes. Yeah. 
Well, this year I had promised myself that I was I was going to cut back on the number of tomatoes I grew. And I don't even remember how many I, I grew last year. And I don't have 600 in the ground like you. So I, I, I feel a little better about myself. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> somebody asks me, how many p- tomato, uh, tomatoes did you plant? And I said, oh, I think about 40. And then I sat down and I started figuring it up. And I think I had 82. Oh, <laughs> That's a lot. That's so a lot. It's just that that way with with so many things that it's uh, all of a sudden then it's like okay what am I going to do with all of this and how am I going to preserve it and then the other thing for me too and I don't know how it is for you guys but uh, I, I plant I use the square foot gardening method so that's an intense intensive planting method to begin with and then sometimes I just always have a a temptation to add a one or two here, you know, and kind of crowd things a little bit more. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm like, I got to thin that, but then thinning it's painful. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I, I feel like I'm wasting food every time I thin something. And yet I know in my head I need to do it. Right. But, right. uh, it's, it's tough. It's hard with this lifestyle and, and with farming in general, because you've always got to be thinking months in advance. Mm-hmm. You know? with anything livestock or or the garden you have to see it in your mind or have experienced in the past you know what it's going to look like in three months or in six months or in a year you know yeah that that's a great point and you know one of the one of the lessons that uh, i learned the hard way and it's one that right now i'm not really quite sure how i can fix it um but that is one that i was um setting my raised beds up i was trying you know i want to grow as much food as i can and in a small you know, bit of area. And I put my, my beds too close together. I think I've got them like 18 inches apart, which is great when you're planting seeds. But once that stuff starts coming on and you're trying to get through there to harvest, you kind of feel like you're going through a jungle. So I don't know. I may need to get the weed whacker out. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Our squash, that's hap- that happened to our squash and zucchini bed this year. It just took over. I mean, <laughs> I was climbing through the things to get yeah, the yeah, to get the <laughs> fruit out. And that's not fun stuff to climb through. No. <laughs> <laughs> can, that can be a little bit on the uh, the rough side, shall we say. So are, are there any other kind of things that you, you've learned along the way that just didn't work for you that other people might say, you need to try this and, and you tried it and it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't work? Well, I have, I have some uh, honeybees and I've tried lots of things with them. I've tried raising queens. I've tried, you know, letting them swarm on their own. I've tried all kinds of stuff. And, and I'm still learning with honeybees. You know, they, they want to reproduce by swarming, and, and that means they leave the hive. You know, that's part of the part of the, the, th- the issue you're dealing with. And then also, uh, I mean, they're dying for no reason. So that's another thing you're dealing with. So not only are you are you learning from your failures with, with bees, but you're up against all kinds of environmental factors with with honeybees as well so mm. that's something that I've, I've i feel like i failed a lot at is the honeybees just because i don't know what i'm doing or <laughs> i don't ha- i don't take the time to do something right or something i don't know i think well yeah i think that's one thing that you really enjoy is yeah. the bees i don't know if it's because it's a challenge or you know you're still figuring it out but like you really enjoy the bees but i think it is very time consuming and you mm-hmm. feel like you just don't have the time to yeah. to really pay enough attention to them you know and work them properly or whatever Mm -hmm. so and it is tough i mean there's only so many hours in the day and uh there comes a point in time where it's just something has to give that's right um now i I, up to this point i've kind of you know i I focused on the things that didn't work but (laughs) i you know we want to also celebrate the successes Mm -hmm. so besides the 600 tomato plants and the fact that you're harvesting a ton at a time, um, which to me sounds like uh, a pretty good success. Um, <laughs> what are some other successes that you've experienced on your, on your homestead? I would say the garden in general. Um, we, we stopped using the tractor in the garden three years ago, I guess, and it's just become more abundant since then. That's been a success for sure. You know, we, we, instead of taking away nutrients by plowing and cultivating and disking and all that, and letting them wash away every time it rains. We're just, we're adding to the garden every year with compost and 
leaf mulch and, and keeping it covered and that kind of thing. So, And is there a particular style of gardening that you're subscribing to? I mean, are you using the back to Eden method or lasagna style gardening, Ruth style? Um, I would say it's uh, probably back to Eden, but um, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, with the tomatoes, the way I've got them laid out, I, I had to use my wheel hoe to keep the, the weed pressure knocked back. And so I am lightly cultivating between the tomatoes. Uh, but if I had a preference, I, I would cover the whole thing in wood chips and uh, plant plant into the wood chips. So definitely it's it's leaning more towards the, the we'll call it a deep mulch method. Yeah. Um, right. You know, and, and again, yeah. back to Eden, Ruth Stout, lasagna style gardening are all examples of that. Yeah. And as far as when you when you do I use the term cultivate, but are you broad forking it or? I don't have a, a broad fork, but I do have like a, uh, a potato fork or something like that. And, and I usually do that in the early spring or something when I'm, when I'm prepping the beds. But um, the wheel hoe is just for keeping the weed pressure back. It's just got a, um, it has several attachments. Um, it's from Haas Tools. And so they have several attachments. It's, uh, it's called an oscillating hoe, and it just slices the top uh, one inch and slices the weeds into. So you're still maintaining the integrity of the soil, but uh, it, it's knocking the weeds weeds on down. Yeah. Um, besides the gardener, you know, what are some of your other successes that you've had? I would say our land flock. Um, we when we first got those, we had uh, tons of hulk and predator issues mm-hmm. with our chickens. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had coyotes in our, in our yard after our chickens and hawks all the time. And slowly we figured out things that worked. You know, we got a, a dog, we've got geese, we have things that deter the predators. And so um, we've gotten to a point where we don't really lose chickens anymore to predators. And mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, I'm assuming that's because of the, the dog and the geese and the things we've done, but um, that's been nice. And do you keep your lane flock in uh, in tractors, or do you have them in a uh, a chicken coop? Are they free ranging? What's your what's your approach there? They're free ranging, so I have a, a mobile coop out on the pasture that they roost in, but they're free ranging during the day out mm-hmm. in the pasture. And do you have them? Do you have electric netting around them, or sometimes? Uh, right now, they're not. I just got through moving the cows through the pasture that they're in. And so I let the chickens have the whole pasture so they can scratch through the, the cow patties. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that, you know, that's just, uh, I guess I, we would attribute that probably to, to Joel Salatin, that style of, right. uh, of bring the cows through and then bring the chickens through. And, right. you know, and that's, I mean, there's so many benefits to that from the standpoint of spreading the manure even further and, um, dealing with the, the pest issues, breaking the pest cycle. I, I wish I had the land to be able to do something like that. Unfortunately, we're on a little over two acres and the way our, our land is laid out, it just doesn't lend itself to to that style of um, of animal management. But, but boy, it's a beautiful thing when, it, when it's done right. Right. Yeah, I really enjoy that part. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoy having the cows and the sheep and I enjoy moving them every day and seeing what the the land looks like after they're you know after they're gone for a few weeks. Um, I really enjoy that part of it. I, I think it was I think it was on to I, I, was it the video? Did you release a video today with regards to your um, the Cornish crosses? Um, or I think it was maybe the most recent one you've released, yeah. and you were sh- you were showing how the the grass uh, had greened up where you had brought the the previous batch through. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, especially behind those meat birds. I mean, and that's just within like three weeks. It's a completely different color, and and it just looks completely different. Um, but the cows, the cows will do the same thing. It's just a little slower, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, to a certain extent, there's that. I don't want to call it an immediate, but it, it's it's a quick payoff, um, or maybe maybe a payoff isn't the right right word, but but it's it's a quick indicator to you a visual indicator that you are feeding and caring for your soil and and therefore that's going to feed and care for you. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, it's funny, especially during tax season, we, sometimes I view our feed as fertilizer, you know, (laughs) some, 
some of our purchases I would categorize as fertilizers. I mean, other people would say, let's just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I, I mean, it is true. It, it because again, what goes in must come out, and uh, <laughs> so it's it's definitely a, a fertilizer in the making. We should say. That's right. Now, you guys, you said you have cows, and so is it uh, milk cows and and um, beef cows? So the majority of the herd are Dexters, which is a smaller, a smaller breed. Oh, I love them. Mm-hmm. No, they're, they're very docile. Um, I mean, our kids can can move them. I can just ask the kids to go move the cows, and they can they can take care of it. Mm-hmm. It's not not a problem. I mean, they all have horns. I know a lot of people are concerned about cows with horns, but um, that, that hasn't been an issue at all. You know, they don't they don't they're not intimidating to us, and they don't hurt each other. Um, and then we have one dairy cow. She is a a bell fair, which is a Dexter and Jersey cross. Okay. And we've had her for two years. And how is, I mean, she, does she have kind of the, the size of the Dexter, but the milk of the Jersey or how are you finding that? Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah. She's, she's pretty small, but she, she gives about two gallons a day typically. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I love those Dexter. In fact, I, I, I've always, you know, I, I dream someday of having a, a, a small herd of my own and I've kind of bounced between the the Dexters, American Milking Devons, and and the Scottish Highlands. And yeah. obviously they all have horns. <laughs> or they, they all can have horns. Let's, let's put it that way. Dexters can be pulled and, and obviously you can pull anything, but the Dexters are just Yeah, we love having the cows. Um I mean we run them all all through here. We we have them in our yard, you know, it's just <laughs> Everything's a rotation around here, and so yeah. <laughs> if the pastures need need a little rest, we bring them through the yard. That's less lo- yard you have to mow. That's right. that's not, I'm all about that. Right. I'm always trying to figure out where can I put a garden so I don't have to mow that. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was I think last year I mowed with the lawnmower maybe three times all year. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! That's awesome. I to me. I, and, and this year I have not had to mow quite as often because it's been so hot and dry. But I guess the benefit to that is I ha- is I haven't had to mow because to me that's the biggest. It usually takes me an hour, hour and a half a week to mow. And I, it's just such a waste of time. Yeah. I, I just see it as such a waste. And, and again, because it's been so dry, I haven't been bagging and collecting the grass. Um, and so sometimes when I've been bagging and collecting, I, I kind of do like you do with the, the feed and say, okay, it's fertilizer. Uh, so I say, well, what I'm doing is I'm collecting resources to use to, uh, you know, compost or use as uh, mulch. <laughs> it's, it's the way I justify it in my head. That's right. Yeah. Nothing goes to waste. I do the same thing. We have uh, one of those lawn sweepers and I, I collect ours as well. And that's another thing that in the fall, um, and I and I saw you know the video where you were um, at least one of the videos where you were uh, using the lawn sweeper to 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 um, gather up the leaves in the fall, yeah. and uh, to me uh, I, I that was another thing that I used to dread every year was because we're surrounded by woods and so we have a lot of uh, a lot of leaves in our yard, and I just hated the time that I was putting into gathering all of those leaves and uh and now i see that as gathering resources and to a certain extent i won't say i i enjoy it or i'm excited about it <laughs> i'm not going to go that far yeah. uh, but per- perspective i think changes things right that's right yeah i would say i would say i'm excited about the leaves in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah I'm, I'm, a, I'm a leaf junkie in the fall he really is <laughs> like he will take anybody's leaves who want to get yeah. rid of leaves so. yeah, like driving around like with with a truck <laughs> throwing them in the back yeah. like i'm harvesting resources get out of my way <laughs> yeah I, I've always wanted to do that in some of the, the subdivisions, but I've always been a little leery because so many of those places, they're, they're spraying their lawns. Yeah. And, and so I'm always worried about bringing that home. Right. And, and, I've, and, and, and that's why I've, I've even avoided the leaves because you sometimes can get all of that mixed in there. Right. But my aunt, she doesn't treat her lawn. And every year she calls me up and says, do you want my leaves? I'll be right up to get them. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and I mean, they're multi-purpose because we, we can't 
free range our chickens here. And, and just again, because of the layout, I can't chicken tractor them. So I have them in a large run. They can come and go as they please. But, but obviously then the run gets, you know, basically moonscaped. And so what I'm always doing is throwing leaves in there and throwing weeds in there and throwing whatever I can in there and letting them kind of turn it into compost for me. It's amazing what, what, uh, how much it takes, especially for chickens, how much carbon it takes. Absolutely. How quickly they can break it down. It's amazing to me. Crazy. Yeah. Big time. Um, now you said you had pigs as well, right? Yeah, we have five. Uh, they're called Osabal Island pigs. Okay. What six months? We've had that probably breed. So. Yeah. yeah. But we've had pigs for probably the last five years. Haven't we? Yeah. At least one pig. Yeah. And what drew you to the Osabal Island pigs? We well, we had uh, guinea hogs prior mm-hmm. to these, and uh, we we enjoyed the guinea hogs, mm-hmm. but. Uh, you can only use so much lard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we haven't had, fat. yeah, we have, we still have quarts and quarts of lard. Lard. Yeah. I mean, which I love. I love yeah. having it, but they are just really fatty, yeah. fatty pigs. Yeah. So that, yeah, we, that's actually what I raise. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, they're nice pigs. We, we enjoyed them, mm-hmm. but we wanted a, um, a leaner pig that could forage and, you know, they, they live in the woods. Uh, I've got, we've got uh, some land that's all wooded and uh, so they just kind of fend for themselves. I feed them, you know, a handful of grain every day, but um, they just go get whatever they need from the woods. And are you breeding them? Do you have a breeding program or are you just raising them for meat? Uh, both. They're, they're still fairly young, but they should, they should start having um, little ones this fall, I would imagine. Okay. Uh, three three boars and two sows, and so we'll we'll butcher two of those boars this fall. Mm-hmm. And and are they registered stock? Are they not registered or? They're not. Mm-hmm. They're not. They're so loud. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> They're the loudest pigs we've ever had. They are interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are boisterous. That's a good word. <laughs> and how would you say, as far as size wise, uh, are they to the American guinea hog? They're similar, just not as fat. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So they don't get quite as much, not quite as much lard. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're not, not as round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guinea hogs get, get pretty chubby. Yeah, they, they certainly can. That's, but, you know, then that's one of the things that with, with guinea hogs, it's low and slow. You, yeah. you, you, right. cannot, you cannot speed up that process. Right. Yeah. And, and it's amazing to me with them how much variation there can be from bloodline to bloodline with the American guinea hog being that it's a land race breed you know some of them seem to to get to I, I actually interviewed Kathy Payne who um wrote in essence the book on American guinea hogs and she didn't she she doesn't like my use of the term market weight and and and, and valid reasons why um but when you think about raising pigs for freezer meat, let me put it that way. You know, obviously with the American guinea hogs, sometimes, you know, certain bloodlines can get there in a year and some take 18 months and some take 24 months and yeah. nothing you can do to feed them any differently that I found that speeds up that process. It is what it is. Right. That's right. I guess ours were taking about a year to get where we wanted them to be. And were you butchering them yourselves or were you taking them to somebody else to process for you? Yeah, we did it all here on farm ourselves. Nice. Nice. I, I haven't gotten brave enough to do that yet with a full size pig. I, I did one uh, back in December of 2018. It was a, it was a male that we, we weren't able to, to castrate. And so we, we harvested it early. Yeah. And so that was the first one that my dad and I did. And we learned some, some tough lessons there. Um, but, you know, yeah. you, you always do. You the, you know, you, you learn by doing. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's hard. That's a hard thing to do. You know, it, it's uh, you know, we have a lot of respect for these animals and uh, want to do things the right way from start to finish. And so it's it's hard. It's hard when you're when you're taking another another life. You know, it just causes you to causes you to stop for a minute and be thankful. You know. So. Absolutely, and and again, it goes back to that value. You know, I, I, I just, I, I so strongly believe that when you're the one that pulls the trigger or you're the one that passes the knife and you take that life, you value that. And you want to make sure that everything from the nose to the tail and nothing goes to waste. Right. Um, That's right. 
you definitely value it. I think a whole, you look at it a whole lot differently. That's for sure. Yeah. And, and one of the things, you know, people will, will tell me, you know, and I'm sure you guys hear this as well. You know, how in the I just don't understand how in the world you can raise an animal and then kill it and eat it. Um, and you know, the way I look at it is, and, and this might be a little bit harsh because I know it's not for everybody, but, but I also do feel like if you can't kill it and eat it, then maybe you shouldn't eat it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and at the end of the day, those, you know, that those same people don't think twice about going down to KFC and picking up a bucket of chicken. Right. And obviously those animals, you know, I, I don't want to project too much, but I'd like to think that the life that we give our our chickens is uh, a little better than what their the, the KFC bound chickens are getting. Right, that's right. It's kind of that focus on you know you want them to have one bad day. That that's your goal. Mm-hmm. With with the boys with the, with the uh, the pigs and the castration, that's that's my least favorite yeah. job of, of all. Especially pigs. Pigs is just the worst. <laughs> it is horrible. <laughs> it it's just. Yeah. Uh, but you do what you got to do. And, and uh, you, uh, like I said, you try to make minimize the number of days like that for sh- certain. Right. One huge benefit of having pigs is the waste part. I mean, when you have a pig, nothing really goes to waste, you know, mm-hmm. uh, all of our scraps go to the pigs, you know, anything, anything that we have that's scrap, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's any kind of food goes to the pig. So. Mm-hmm. You know, we even find that it, it and sometimes with, with the chickens, we, we do the same thing. And sometimes we're, we're struggling. Okay, who gets the scraps today? Yeah. Yeah. For the chickens. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Try to divvy it up here. That's right. There's a, a, a homestead and book that I have that uh, he talks about washing dishes into a, a pan. And so the first, he just talks about the first water that comes off of that, like the rinse water goes to the pigs. There's so many nutrients. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Well, I mean, today I did, you know, uh, we're in the canning season now and I had a canner full of water and, uh, you know, I, I took it out and dumped it to the geese. You yeah. know, why, why just throw it out or dump it down the, the, the drain, you know, let the geese splash around in it and drink it. You know? yeah, that's right. Um, so just, uh, and I think, uh, with, with just about everything, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, and I think this COVID thing has really maybe caused me to, to even think a lot more along these lines, but uh, you know, in the, in the vein of how can we minimize, um, you know, our waste and, and how can we maximize the production from our homestead? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's fairly easy if you just take the time and plan a little bit you know, and, and just think about what you're doing. Yeah putting, putting some thought into it. Um, yep. like you said earlier, you know, sometimes you have to think months down the road, right. but when you try to get those, those systems put in place, those can then pay dividends for you from the standpoint of managing waste and, and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Are there any animals that you will never raise or you will never raise again? <laughs> hmm. Well, we have two goats, but if if I had to say in the goats, we, we wouldn't have those. <laughs> those are just pets, basically, yeah. for our kids. But yeah. and they have pleaded for mm-hmm. to keep them on the farm. But yeah, Adam's kind of over the goats. <laughs> yeah. So that that my wife has drawn the line in in the sand at goats and guinea fowl. <laughs> oh, I can yeah. I can get about just about anything else. Yeah. But goats and guinea fowl shall not come upon this 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 uh, homestead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, we've tried meat rabbits, and they're okay, but um, I don't know. They just didn't really fit well here. I don't yeah. think. We didn't really like the meat. I mean, we I, we liked it. I, I like it, but it's just different. It's different it is. What we're used to. Yeah, it, it's definitely different. My wife doesn't care for it. Um, yeah. We had meat rabbits, and... Right now, I have a couple of freeloading does because my my buck died. I think it was I, almost a year and a half ago, and I just I, I haven't I ha, I just don't have the heart to send the does over the rainbow, and I, I don't have any interest in bringing in another buck because I want to. If I continue doing meat rabbits, I want to switch gears and kind of go in a different direction. But I don't know. There's something about that breeding stock that uh, you're not supposed to get attached, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 
I don't know. It, it's the same way with my pigs. I, I've got, you know, a boar and two sows and um, I, I don't think I could ever eat them. I mean, I, you know, if, if, I guess if push came to shove and the apocalypse happened, um, <laughs> then at that point you, you do what you got to do. But yeah. um, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, we sold our, our breeding pair to uh, our breeding pigs to some friends and, you know, it was tough when they decided to, to butcher one of them. You yeah. know, I mean, it was their, their pig and their choice, but that was mm-hmm. tough. Mm-hmm. To it is. It, they, they just, they've got personalities and uh, I don't know, you, you kind of, mm-hmm. and, and, and I, and I do, I mean, I don't, I try not to name animals that we're going to eat. If we name them, they become something like pork chop or spare rib or, right. you know, right. something along those lines. But my breeding stock, you know, does have legit names. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they have legit personalities to go with those names too. So it makes it a little bit more different. I think that's the other thing too, with the American guinea hogs, because you keep them so long, yeah. um, the temptation and, and maybe the same holds true with the, the cows as well. The temptation is there to, to kind of get a little bit more attached to them than you would the Cornish cross chicken that you've only got around for eight or 10 weeks. Yeah, that's true. All right. And you're right. They do all have personalities, so it is yeah. it's different. Mm-hmm. They kind of become pets, some of them. I mean, we've got turkey. This is our second year doing turkeys. And, I'm, I mean, turkeys are just an absolute hoot. I think you guys <laughs> raised turkeys as well, correct? A long yeah, we, time ago, yeah. yeah. A years. Okay, so, it, so it's been a while, but you did them. So you know what I'm talking about as far as turkeys having personality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, Th- that was that that was a little tougher um la- when i took them last year i didn't process them myself i took and took them and had somebody else do them for me just because i'm not set up to do turkeys right now and um that was dropping them off was tough it was almost as tough as dropping off my pigs yeah so as we kind of wrap things up um what are your future plans for your homestead keep doing what we're doing <laughs> yeah yeah we want to make it uh we want to make a living from here i mean we want able to make enough money to live on and so a big part of that is is um getting rid of our expenses um, which we're down to the to the mortgage and we hope to have that done by the end of the year hopefully and so um that's that's kind of that's what we're working toward Mm -hmm. to be able to make money to just live from here so you're you know basically and there's a fine line i guess between homesteading and farming yeah um and and i'm I, i I've not really quite figured out where that that line is for for different purposes. I think the line is at a bit of a different spot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. You know, for tax purpose, actually, for sales tax purposes versus income tax purposes versus property tax purposes, that the line is kind of all over the place. And then, obviously, as you you talk to people um, and you have those conversations. Okay. What constitutes a farm versus what constitutes a homestead? Uh, I've kind of come to the, to the, I, I like that the moniker farmstead. Yeah. Um, where you kind of marry the two. Right. And so that's c- kind of sounds to me kind of the direction that you're, you're hoping to head because I, I know I have a lot of friends who are farmers and many of them are, you know, they're, they're dairy farmers or they're, you know, they, they've got a singular crop. Uh, and, and outside of that, they don't raise anything else to feed their family. Mm-hmm. So they certainly would not be considered homesteaders. They're, they're good farmers. Uh, they're not homesteaders. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of homesteaders that have no interest whatsoever in selling anything to anybody. So when you can kind of marry those two, I think for, for some people, that's that's a, the sweet spot. Yeah. We got to, I mean, we think about our kids and, and someone has to make a salary from it if they're going to be interested, you know, so that, that's, part of it. you know, we want to get something established and, and I mean, we've got to, you have to have money to buy other things and so, um, or trade, you know, it's nice mm-hmm. to, to just be able to trade mm-hmm. today. I mean, this year we've traded sheep for hay. I've traded tomatoes for hay. I've, you know, we've, we've done lots of trading this year, but uh, anyway, there, there is a fine line, like you said, you know, because we wrestled with, well, do we want to keep an outside job so that we can keep investing into quality and good food and not worry about the money part, you know, if we're, if we're making money from an outside job. But at the same time, we want to be able to do everything from here, you know, so 
and part of making money. So. Yeah, and, and it's you know there. I think there are some people who have this kind of this pie in the sky idea that they're going to go. You know, their definition of homesteading is kind of the 1800s version of homesteading, where the government's going to give them give them land and they're going to go and live off the land. Right. And and I just think that's an absolute myth. Right. Um, right. You you've got to find some way, either whether it's an outside income or through, you know, uh, uh, an on homestead job where you're working remotely or YouTube, you know, selling things, uh, selling vegetables, those kinds of things, and and moving more in the the farming direction. But there there are cer- certain people I think that are chasing self sufficiency and self reliance as the holy grail, and and I think we to, to to head in that direction is awesome. But I say many times I don't think you're ever going to achieve that in this lifetime. Yeah, I mean when you stop and you think about a lot of people when they think of homesteading they think of Mon Pa Ingalls from the you know little house on the prairie, mm-hmm. and and even Pa you know at times would go to work for somebody he would go to town to buy nails or he would go to buy to, you know, town to buy glass or whatever. There's just certain things you're never going to be able to produce. Yeah, that's right. So, and, it, and it takes, it takes people. I mean, it takes neighbors working together because you, you, I mean, I can't do everything. There's, there's things that I don't know how to do, you know? So I, I go get my neighbor's help when we're working on the car or, you know, whatever it is. Absolutely. I can't do. And, and it comes back to that community thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's right. This is right back to kind of right back to where we started. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for taking time to join me today here on the podcast. It's it's really been a, a joy to just chat with you and kind of understand a little bit about your journey and 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 kind of how you've gotten to to where you're at and where you're heading. Um, if people are interested in finding out more about you, um, where's the best place to to come looking? Uh, probably our YouTube channel. We're just Farm Life Outfitters on YouTube and uh, we have a website farmlifeoutfitters.com where we sell our um, graphic tees and things like that. And uh, then I like Instagram as well. We, I enjoy that platform better than some of the others. (laughs) So um, we're just Farm Life Outfitters on Instagram also. Well, excellent. I will go ahead and post links to all of that in the show notes. And, uh, and once again, thank you so much for uh, taking time to join me today. Thank you, Brian. It was fun. Yep.